Hey everybody, David Shapiro here with a video. Today's video is going to be a slightly different flavor from what I normally do, still centered around artificial intelligence. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about a robot tax. This is a proposal that I've been kind of cooking around on the back burner, but I figured it's time to talk about it. So the agenda for today's video is first, let's talk about the economic impact of AI and automation. Why is it that we even need to talk about redistribution and a robot tax? Next, we'll talk about what is this proposed robot tax? How does it work? Uh, we'll build a case for it, say why we need it, and then we'll also look at some of the objections around a potential robot tax, and then we will uh, recap the video. So, automation has already destroyed a lot of jobs. It has created some jobs, but it has created fewer jobs than it has destroyed. This trend is only accelerating. And this is despite what some tech CEOs say. For instance, Satya Nadella recently said that, you know, technologies like being AI is going to create more jobs. Um, I disagree. And I think he knows that, but it's just a super unpopular thing to say that AI is going to destroy jobs. Uh, because we don't have an answer yet. We don't have a solution. And so if you say, if you come out and say, oh yeah, you know, AI is going to destroy 50% of jobs in the next 10 years, uh, that's a super unpopular move. Um, but the bottom line is that machines are cheaper than humans. That's all there is to it. And part of capitalism, part of the free market economics is to find efficiencies. If machines are more efficient than humans, then companies are going to use machines. It's that simple. So industrial automation in the form of robotics is already doing this even before modern AI. Now, looking forward, AI has the potential of destroying uh, more than 60% of American jobs. So my personal prediction is that we're going to see 70% unemployment by 2030. So what happens when most Americans lose their job permanently? We basically have two options. There's going to be riot in the streets or redistribution of wealth. And if it, basically the redistribution is coming, it's just whether or not the riots happen first. So what we'll need to do is adopt an abundance mentality and get rid of our scarcity mentality. Basically right now, everything is a zero sum game. And we have this crab mentality that says, you know what? I got mine to heck with everyone else. But instead, we will need to decide collectively if we want to redistribute some of the value created by the rise of automation and AI. So what do I mean by this? It is forecasted that GDP will rise faster than it has ever risen thanks to AI. We are talking trillions upon trillions of dollars of GDP growth. This is good for capitalism. I mean, there's no other way of, of describing that. The best thing to happen to capitalism in the history of capitalism will be artificial intelligence. The question becomes, who gets to capture that value and why? Basically, we have the choice of moving towards a cyberpunk hell or a solarpunk utopia. And it's literally just a choice. There's nothing forcing it to go one way or the other. So, with that said... This is what I mean by robot tax. Redistribution of benefits from optimization technologies, or alternatively, redistribution of benefits obtained through automation. I'm not really sure if I like that A bolted on at the end. But the idea is we're redistributing the benefits of AI and automation. All right, so what is this robot tax? It is a comprehensive proposal that is sort of like a UBI, a universal basic income, but one of the key differences between a robot tax and a UBI is that it's not an entitlement. One problem with entitlement programs is that they're not intrinsically funded unless you bolt a tax on with it, such as like Medicare tax. So rather than just saying everyone is entitled to a, a stimulus check every month, what if we have it so that it's actually tied directly to a tax system, a tax structure, that means that it is automatically self-funded? Kind of like how we have sales tax um, or gasoline subsidies. So we've got plenty of examples of taxes and subsidies that are that are grafted onto our economy um, with very specific purposes. 
So if we do it this way, it's superior to a UBI and that it's not just a fixed rate, it's actually gonna be directly proportional to how much impact AI has had on the economy. So one thing that this does, that the robot tax does, is it incentivizes economic gains through automation AI and actually job displacement. So what I mean by this is that the robot tax actually encourages people and companies to replace human labor. Basically, this is a new paradigm of thinking about it saying it's actually good if we decouple economic growth from the primary constraint of human labor. And we should reward companies for doing this and then also reward people if they help you know, automate their jobs away or if they get their job automated away out from under them because then they're, they're liberated to work on other things. So rather than fight this trend, we should embrace it, right? You know, you may, there's, there's no stopping a rising tide. There's no changing, you know, a macroeconomic trend this powerful. By going ahead and working on a robot tax, we're going to protect citizens, not just workers, all citizens, by ensuring that all citizens get a slice of this, this rapidly growing pie. And it will also help shepherd in a new way of living, a post-labor way of living. And furthermore, it protects national security by incentivizing AI research. America is presently falling behind some of our key uh, geopolitical competitors. This is dangerous for us, and we should be living, leading the charge. All right, so how does this robot tax work? It's similar to a VAT or a value-added tax. Um, and also I need to add a caveat that this is just my current way of thinking and I am not a tax expert nor am I an economics expert. I just read some books on the, on the topic and this is what this is the idea I got. So basically we should target goods and services that are produced efficiently with AI and automation. This will raise the price of those goods and services a little bit, kind of like how, um, how gas subsidies or gas taxes raise your price at the pump. Um, but at the same time, uh, AI and automation will drive down the price of those goods and services. So the net effect is that we'll still see lower prices um, for the goods and services we consume that are produced with AI. And some of that uh, consumption-based tax will then be redistributed to everyone else. It could also include uh, tariffs, incentives, and exceptions. So for instance, um, we could include uh, uh, protections for small businesses and essential industries. Maybe those could have uh, exemptions so that they don't get uh, disproportionately impacted. So for instance, healthcare might be one of the primary industries that we accept from this. Although I will say, um, Healthcare is one of our prime, our most expensive things. So maybe we should actually double down on incentives in the healthcare industry. Let's automate as much of the healthcare industry as we can to drive costs down. Again, this is there's some room for discussion here. Another thing is we could use this policy to incentivize deglobalization. So deglobalization is a whole uh, trend unto itself, and we'll talk a little bit more about deglobalization in a later slide, but through tariffs, incentives, uh, exemptions, and exceptions, we could also advance that initiative, which will further reinforce uh, national security interests. Um, and again, we can reward companies that advance this initiative. So for instance, if we give companies tax breaks or other tax incentives for increasing automation. So for instance, if they are able to double their output with the same headcount or fewer employees, they should be rewarded for that. Because again, the goal is to transition from a labor-based, sorry, labor-based economy to a post-labor market. Um, so that is, those are some of the ideas of, of how I imagine a robot tax could work. Okay, so now let's talk about, let's, let's build a case for this robot tax. So number one, AI and automation is coming whether you like it or not. Like, there's nothing we can do to stop it. You can't regulate this stuff out of existence. It, it, the cat is already out of the bag. So, with that in mind, we have an opportunity to decouple economic productivity, that's GDP growth, from the primary constraint of human labor. The magnitude of this is difficult to overstate. Uh, but I'll try. Um, 
Another thing is everyone needs to eat. Like we have seen what hunger and desperation does around the world. And if people lose their livelihood and there's nothing to like save them or prop them up, there will be riots. That's all there is to it. We also need to stay at the cutting edge of AI, else we will fall behind. And that is not in anyone's interest. So let's hit two birds with one stone. Let's shore up national interests, national security, and corporate interests, as well as the private interests of all citizens. Okay, so what does the robot, robot tax do? What is, a, what, is a, what is a case for it? One is it promotes innovation. In general, we believe that innovation is good. This is one of the, the cornerstones of free market economics, of capitalism and neoliberalism, is that the quest for efficiency, the quest for economic efficiency, incentivizes uh, uh, technological advancement. So why don't we just lean into this and reward it? So if we reward companies for making this transition, for helping it happen by you know giving them tax breaks or whatever, and displacing some of that tax burden to the people consuming their goods and services, that will uh, uh, help reinforce this cycle of decoupling economic growth from human labor. Because humans are expensive. That's all there is to it. I've said it again and again, economic growth. This is the biggest carrot for some people. Whether you're a, a corporation or a shareholder, whatever, you want to see GDP grow up. You, GDP growth go up, sorry, um, you want to see your stocks go up. I get it, you know. Um, <laughs> I want to see the same thing. I'm a shareholder in my own uh, startup. I want those prices to go up. At the same time, I don't want to hurt anybody. So what I'm trying to do here is to uh, uh, propose something that'll strike the balance and meet everyone's interest. Um, <laughs> I'm going to keep ringing this bell, decoupling economic growth from human labor, uh, will create a uh, economic paradigm hitherto undreamt of. Thanks, Doctor Strange. Um, it's it it is difficult to imagine this paradigm um, at the beginning, but one thing that you can do is think about how fiat currency decoupled monetary policy from the gold standard. A lot of people think that we should go back to the gold standard, but the the economic invention of fiat currency was brilliant. And we can do the same by decoupling human labor from economic growth. National security. So this is another topic that I know that a lot of voters and politicians care about. And um, as I was exploring this, it, it occurred to me that actually leaning into AI is a huge, a primary national security interest. We already see this with the CHIPS Act, uh, which was a, a bill that was recently passed that had to do with... Um, uh, export control, and a few other aspects. But think of it this way. If we lean into AI, then our industrial automation capacity and our manufacturing capacity goes through the roof. And the ability to manufacture goods, whether they are helicopters and tanks, or, or even just stuff that we need, cars, all of that it shores up our national security, especially if we bring it all back onshore. Um, data information and intelligence. The smarter our machines become, the more secure we are as a nation. And this includes, this is not just America that I'm talking about. This includes all of our allies across the world. Excuse me. And one thing that I need to point out is that this competition already exists. I'm not making this up. It's already out there. I watched a, um, an interview with Admiral um, Aquilino, a four-star admiral of the, of the Pacific Theater. And he, like, you know... The Department of Defense, this is already on their radar. So the rest of us also, you know, can participate. Self-reliance as a nation is a rising trend, as is deglobalization. There are three primary reasons for this. One is the pandemic. The pandemic showed just how fragile global supply chains are, and it will still take years to untangle those. Finally, Russia and China Despite decades of neoliberalism and global policy, they're still not playing nice. Like, that's all there is to it. It is a failed experiment. Glo like, globalization saying bring everyone to the table of democracy and, and liberalized free markets didn't work. So now the rising trend is towards deglobalization, which says, actually, maybe we need to be a little bit more insular and maybe we need to bring stuff onshore. 
And this is already happening, by the way. There are huge projects of bringing chip manufacturers on back onto U.S. and European soil. So this is already happening. And then from a, a more direct military uh, uh, perspective, um, the United States Air Force recently tested a fully automated F-16. No pilot. Um, and then, of course, there's AI and drones. It's coming. The military is doing it. So the rest of the economy also needs to participate and, and make sure that we um, are in lockstep on this topic. Okay, so I feel like I've outlined a really compelling argument to work on a robot tax, to incentivize AI and advancement, and also to shore up um, you know, the citizenry. Now, let's talk about some of the potential objections that you uh, voters, politicians, and companies might have. So first, governmental overreach. Obviously, there are plenty of people out there who believe that smaller government is better. This is classical conservatives and libertarians, and some progressives as well. Um, number two, unintended consequences. What could go wrong? Number three, difficulty implementing. Nothing like this has ever been attempted, so it's going to be hard. Number four, market distort distortions and inefficiencies. We might accidentally create problems that don't exist today. And then five, finally, moral concerns around rewarding people for not working, basically. So number one, governmental overreach. Why does the government need to be involved at all? It's true that a totally free market will reduce prices of goods and services with AI. It's happening. It's already happening. You look at how cheap uh, technologies like ChatGPT are and how powerful they are. For $20 a month, I have a tool that accelerates everything that I do by a factor of 4 or 10x. Like, so as a writer, just as a, as a quick aside, as a writer, I use ChatGPT to help me brainstorm and plan chapters. I do that for a few minutes. It is, like, worth several hours of talking to other writers. Um, and then I sit down and I can write a 4,500 chapter, a word chapter, in one sitting with the, with the help of AI. This is an, an entirely new paradigm. So AI is already making things cheaper, better, faster, and so on. So why does the government need to get involved? The problem is that many people will be permanently unemployed. And we don't know how bad it's going to get. What if all of like what if nobody ever makes money from writing fiction ever again? We're already seeing a huge trend towards AI generated art. And whether or not that's fair, it kind of sucks. And so if people become permanently unemployed, consumers will have a reduced ability to participate in the market, and that's just bad for the economy. Consumers need money in their pocket in order to spend it. That's all there is to it. If consumers don't have money, they can't spend it, and the economy slows down. So therefore, we need at least some government intervention to ensure that um, that consumers have money to spend. It's that, it's that simple. Um, it can be measured through velocity of currency. That is basically how long um, every dollar stays stationary before it's spent. So keeping the velocity of currency up by taxing, redistributing, and then putting it back in the, in the hands of people that are going to spend it almost immediately, that's generally good for the economy. And a robot tax could help, uh, ha help with that. Unintended consequences. So rather than talking about the unintended consequences, let's talk about the known consequences of having hungry, desperate, and angry citizens. The January 6th riots, a couple years ago already, um, demonstrate just how angry people already are. One thing that a friend of mine pointed out was that both sides of the political spectrum have been really upset. Left, right, a lot of people are really angry. And that's only going to get worse if we start to see record levels of unemployment. We have record levels of unemployment right now. But the cost of inaction is staggering. The cost of inaction is potentially monumental. So that means we should proceed with some kind of what I propose is the robot tax. Because, again, the cost of doing nothing is probably much higher than the cost of any unintended consequences. Now, that being said, we shouldn't be reckless because we absolutely could make it worse. So we should proceed cautiously, but with clarity of intent. And finally, 
any unintended, unintended consequences can be mitigated by experimenting and modifying the robot tax as we go. So for instance, it could be implemented slowly and scaled over time. On the topic of how difficult it is to implement, there's a lot of problems with this. So one, how do you measure the economic impacts from AI and automation? How do you know how much to tax these goods and services? Because we don't want to disincentivize AI and automation, right? Like that would have the literally the opposite effect. If we tax it too much, then people are going to say, actually, let's just keep the human laborers. And maybe that can be a, a deliberate step to slow down the, de the deployment of AI and automation. Maybe we do tax those at a certain rate and uh, in order to mitigate uh, how fast the change is. But at the same time, we don't want to stifle innovation. So it's a very delicate balance to strike there. And then how do you decide which goods and services get taxed and how much? Because if it's going to take, you know, if you have to fill out forms or get inspections and get certified, this, that, or the other, that's a lot of work. So maybe that's why I say maybe a VAT, VAT tax is the, is the best way um, so, that, uh, so that basically, you know, it's a point of sales tax. It might also be easier or better to tax the companies that uh, lay off employees. So for instance, if an employee gets laid off due to getting automated out of a job, maybe that's where you tax it. But then you create an incentive to change hiring practices. And this is one place that I agree with neoliberalism. Let, let the labor market shape itself, but then you, you tax probably at the point of consumption. Again, I'm not an expert, but this is kind of the best that I've got um, at this point. And then finally, how do you decide who gets how much? Should it be universal and equal, like the, you know, the idea of a universal basic income? But then you ask a question, what if a high earner gets mechanized, me mechanized out of a job? Isn't that a little bit unfair? Like, what if, what if someone who is, like I was, an IT professional making six figures, what if I got mechanized out of a job and then it's like, oh, here's, uh, you know, $800 a month, um, you know, as opposed to the nearly $10,000 a month uh, that you got before. Like, that seems deeply unfair. So there are uh, many questions around unfairness, especially as more and more white-collar workers get mechanized out of a job. But then also... Look at the artists, look at the writers and graphic artists that are already struggling and already being harmed by this. So uh, it's gonna be indiscriminate, basically. Uh, so this is, this, is a, this is a pain point of implementation, but I'm not saying that this is a barrier to implementation. It's just gonna take some wrangling and negotiation. Something a little bit more abstract is the concept of market distortions and inefficiencies. If the robot tax is improperly um, implemented, it could incentivize gamifying or rigging the system. One of the best examples we have of this is corn and oil subsidies. So corn subsidies have, and soybean subsidies have meant that a lot of farmers just keep planting soy and corn, even if it's not needed, because they, they know that government will guarantee a rate for them. Um, ditto for oil subsidies. So um, creating subsidies or perverse incentives can create a lopsided market that is actually kind of paralyzed and um, is not adaptive. So we need to be really careful that whatever we do around a robot tax doesn't create a lopsided or paralyzed market. Another example of how this kind of thing can go wrong is the well-intentioned PPP loans, the, the Paycheck Protection Program loans that happened during the pandemic. They were right, they were super inefficient and they were rife with abuse. Um, but an example of something that did work were the stimulus checks. So I, at the time, I made too much money, so I didn't get a stimulus check, but a lot of my friends did. And it was like magic. Like they just woke up and there was an $1,100 check in their bank account or however much it was. I guess it varied from person to person. So we have a model for just depositing money um, very efficiently into people's bank accounts. It can be done. Now, of course, that that assumes that someone has a bank account and not everyone does, especially the most... Um, uh, disempowered and disenfranchised people, many of them don't have bank accounts. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, we will need to be very careful about incentivizing the behavior that we actually want to see. And I, as far as I can tell, there are three primary um, places that we need to look at behavior. One is corporations, companies. 
what behavior do we want to do do we want to incentivize companies like i said earlier in the video i think that what we should incentivize is that transition to a post labor market to to decouple um, com, uh, corporate profits from human labor um, then what do we what what do we want to incentivize consumers to do well we want consumers to consume right that is just a, a, a baseline assumption of neoliberalism is that you want consumers to spend money. The best way to get consumers to spend money is for them to feel safe and secure so that they know that they can spend the money that they, that they have. If people don't feel safe and secure, they save. And that's bad for the economy, right? Because if you're, if you're waiting like to get health care, if you're waiting to buy a new car, if you're waiting to fix out your home because of uncertainty, that's not good. So if we can use the robot tax to one, incentivize companies to move towards a post-labor economy, and then also give consumers the confidence to spend and not, and not need to save, imagine that the need for retirement savings goes away permanently. That's the, that's the future I wanna live in, where we all have so much financial security that we don't even need to think about saving. And then finally, how do we want the market as a whole to behave? And by market, I mean the goods and services markets, and then also the labor market. Um, it, there will almost certainly always be a need for some human workers, um, whether it's the AI researchers, at least until AI takes over its own research, um, you know, uh, childcare, education, um, me, uh, some aspects of medicine. We will always need to have some human workers. And so we don't wanna disincentivize all people from quitting permanently, but that being said, we also want to support the people that can no longer work. Finally, moral qualms. One of the biggest uh, uh, rejections of things like UBI is what do people deserve? You know, you don't deserve anything unless you work hard. So this goes back to the founding of America with our Protestant work ethic, which basically says laziness is sinful. I've made plenty of other videos about this, so I won't get too, too deep into it. But we do need to address the elephant in the room. There are plenty of people who say, if you don't work, you don't deserve anything. That if you don't work, you should be punished for it. There are, I mean, there are plenty of people, just go on the internet. There are people who say that it is immoral to be lazy, to be unemployed, and that it should be uncomfortable. That, that the incentive to get back to work should be there and it should be uh, painful to be unemployed. I don't, think that, I don't think that that's fair. I don't think that people deserve to be in pain or to be scared if they lose their job to AI and automation. So we can talk about morality, but I'm just as eager to flip that script and turn it around and say, actually, maybe it shouldn't be, maybe people shouldn't be punished. Maybe people shouldn't be scared and afraid and hungry. Maybe using, maybe using those negative incentives, you know, that, that, that threat of abandonment, maybe that's not the kind of society we should build. Now, another argument is, well, if people don't need to work, won't they become lazy and useless? Don't we need an occupation to even have our identity? Um, from my personal experience, I quit my day job a month ago. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, it is an absolute myth that we need work in order to feel um, alive or to have an identity. That is a total fabrication that the establishment tells you because again, the economy has been driven by the need for human labor. But if we decouple human labor from the economy, then you know the capitalists won't care. It's like, go do whatever you want, right? As long as, as long as consumers have money and they spend it, the capitalists won't care. So the myth that you need an occupation, that you need a job to stake your identity on, total lie, absolute fabrication. That being said, humans love challenges. We need to feel a sense of mastery and competence. That's why people play so many video games. A video game is a, is a carefully curated challenge. Uh, a lot of people do gardening. They learn about gardening or they work on cars, right? Whoever, whatever. We all find stuff that makes us feel alive and engaged and we don't need a job to do that. That being said, there will still be economic incentives to do things like start a business or find other ways to contribute. It's just that it won't be absolutely necessary to find a job in order to live, right? And in, in fact, one thing that many UBI studies have found is that with that baseline level of security, people often get more creative and find better ways to contribute. Sometimes they go get better um, education 
or they contribute back in their community in various ways, they volunteer more, doesn't matter. The point is, is that once people have a baseline level of security, they often do more for the economy. And because of this, the market might end up more flexible and more efficient with the robot tax. So imagine that we allow people to leave jobs that aren't working for them, and that incentivizes companies to replace them with machines anyways. But then if you have a huge pool of surplus labor whenever they're needed, that is going to be really, really good for the economy because a surplus of labor will uh, drive down prices, uh, the cost of labor, which will then provide more benefits because cheaper labor means uh, more investment and also bringing more stuff back on shore. Remember, deglobalization. So I think if the robot tax is implemented correctly, we're going to get compounding returns. All right. So in conclusion, AI is coming. That's all there is to it. AI is going to be really good for the GDP. And by extension, it's going to be really good for stocks. That being said, we probably need to figure out a way to share. The paradigm shift that we're facing is completely new. We have never seen anything like this. And the key thing, the key fundamental aspect of this is that we have an opportunity to decouple economic growth and output from the biggest constraint right now, which is human labor. So with all that said, thanks for watching. Um, I hope that this uh, resonates with you. Um, and uh, yeah, talk again soon.